If I were to ask you, name the wide receiver who had more catches and receiving yards than Chad Johnson, Michael Irvin, and Calvin Johnson in a career, would you guess the correct wide receiver? I'll give you a hint. His last name ends in Smith, and he's one of the greatest cats of all time. Yep, this seldom talked about wide receiver has better stats than six current wide receivers already in the hall. In fact, one of those wideouts he had a close link to. Being a victim of being in the wrong setting at the wrong time where you're not really needed. This mystery wide receiver, in my opinion, is easily the most underrated wide receiver in the last 25 years of the NFL. Also, it doesn't help that you play for, if not the smallest market team in the league. In a state littered with pro slash big time college teams, nobody pays attention to that pro football team in Jacksonville. Also to its all time leading receiver. But before we start in Jacksonville, we got to go to Dallas and the 1992 season where Jimmy Smith's career started. A lot of people don't know that Jimmy Smith actually won a Super Bowl in his rookie year in 92 as a special teams ace for the Cowboys. But that will be his last NFL action for a while due to several life-threatening surgeries, which has to do with an appendix being removed due to infections, also having issues with his other intestines. Team doctors failed to treat his future ailments and did not diagnose him correctly when he had his underlying health issues. He did not play for the 1993 season and was cut after the season was over. After getting to healthy status, he failed to make a regular season roster in 1994 and he was on the street for a whole year. It seems like in a short period of time, he went from being on America's team to out of the league by the mid 90s completely. His career would have likely been over, but one person had kept their eyes on him since his college days at Jackson State. Ron Hill, director of player personnel, had been wanting Jimmy Smith's services for years. So he made it a point to sign the homeless Smith as part of the newly formed Jaguars in 1995. It just goes to show that you never know who's watching you. He came to an upstart team with a room full of unknown wide receivers like himself. With some medical baggage and lack of playing time, Jimmy was on an expansion team trying to find his way on an NFL offense. But in 95, Jimmy caught his first NFL regular season pass at 26 years of age. To compare age and careers to a modern day wideout, Juju Smith is only 24 coming into his fifth season. He already has caught over 300 balls so far in his short career. The 95 season was the first season that Smith played in in three years. Also, it was his first season on offense. Not too shabby for his first action as a wideout. The next year, in 1996, the Jags signed his counterpart, Keaton McCardell. With number 87, Jimmy's career would never be the same. Talk about a guy who had life-altering surgery a couple years before to capturing his first 1,000 yards receiving season in 96 after he was homeless in 1994. Jimmy's new moon of success came when he and Mark Brunel formed a trust with each other, along with newly formed duo with McCarter, to become the most dangerous pass combination of the late 90s. Think about this. When the 96 Jags played the Bills in the first round of the playoffs, that was really the start and end of two teams. The have won nine straight playoff games on this field, and they're favored to do it again today. These young guys, quick as they got in, quick as they got to get their ass out. Quick as they got in, quick as they got to get their ass out. The duo of Kelly, Thomas, and Reed ended that day, and the duo of Brunel, Smith, and McCardell had really arrived with their first playoff win. That playoff game was an important story point of the 90s decade.
Along with Jimmy's breakout season, came with his first Pro Bowl in 1997. The Pro Bowl will be a normality for him for the next five straight seasons, with the Jags making to the playoffs every year for the rest of the 90s. I went and checked some numbers of pass catchers from 1996 to 2002. Jimmy Smith had the most receiving yards from those years. Better production than Hall of Fame wide receivers during that time. More than Rod Smith, Tim Brown, Isaac Bruce. Not to mention Keenan was his teammate. So great competition wasn't far away. One thing I keep hearing from Hall of Fame players is that, quote, I was one of the best of my era, unquote. Or that, quote, I was the best, unquote. Well, in Jimmy's case, I don't think there were two wide receivers that were better than him in the late 1990s, regardless of market in which he played. One receiver who we didn't mention was Michael Irvin, who was one of the best in the 90s. Little do people know, Jimmy and the playmaker were teammates in 92 and 93. Just watch me. You know what my rookie year when I was drafted by the Cowboys? I did everything Mike did. Everything Mike Irvin did, I did. Why do I mention Irvin? Because Irvin and Jimmy would have the same issues with a common substance. With all the success that Jimmy was obtaining, Jimmy would have to confront his secret that he was hiding for years, and it will be known to the public in 2001. This will be an ongoing problem for the rest of his career. Amazingly enough, he still got to the Pro Bowl in 2001. After the 01 season, his partner in crime, Keenan McCardell, who he played with for six years, went to Tampa Bay. Keenan was very influential person on and off the field for Smith. The fervor number 87 got away from number 82. It seemed like 82 was really left alone with his demons. From a production standpoint, he was producing at a high level now in his 30s, but in 2003, he missed four regular season games, the most he's missed since his rookie year. This was his first time he faced punishment for his cocaine usage. Wait, wait, let's go back to 01 for a second. Remember the beginning of Jimmy's career, he went through an appendix surgery? Well, he had to go through that same surgery that year which was 01. Amazingly, he never missed time from the playing field for it. So let's just think, Jimmy was addicted to cocaine and had multiple severe surgeries and still was on top of his game. So Jimmy finished the 03 season with 805 receiving yards in only 12 games. His first sub 1000 yard season since 95. But what was more important was his drug abuse which will get worse. His buddy, Thunder, despite being on another team, really started to question Jimmy's lifestyle. Here is a statement that he made on his feelings towards the matter. Also, this was the time where he was in his mid thirties, but his play did not match his age because he was still one of the best in the league. Although he was a top wideout in the league, Jimmy felt as though playing was no longer necessary. Also the fact that the Jaguars became less and less competitive since the 90s. So Jimmy retired at the age of 37 in 2006. The Jaguars have only had 3,000 yard receivers since his departure. So here's the question of the video. Why was Smith underrated? Well, this will have to be a later answer that will have to be cut up in parts. Florida is a big sports state. Teams like the Dolphins and Bucks have been around for 40 plus years, while the Jaguars are still kind of new compared to most NFL clubs. There's just a lot of competition in that state alone, college and pro. The Bucks and Finns have a combined five championships while Jacksonville has yet to appear in the Super Bowl. And sometimes the collegiate sports teams are actually more competitive 
than the professional sports teams. Jimmy played in the 90s and 2000s where there was limited coverage like it is now. Most of the coverage went to the bigger markets like New York, Dallas, San Francisco, and Chicago just to name a few. Also, it doesn't help that you play for a brand new franchise in the state that already has two NFL teams in it. And let's be real, how much coverage are you going to get when you have Dan Marino playing for the Dolphins and when you have the height of the Miami Hurricanes dynasty on television? Also with Florida State being nearby in Tallahassee. The 21st century player has access to the internet and self-promotion through several platforms. When Jimmy was playing, quote unquote social media was email, dial-up, Nokia phones, and pagers. The modern day player has access to unlock an unlimited brand about themselves and on and off the field, controlling their own narrative. There was no such thing as going viral in 2001 or 1998. The only way you went viral is if you made it on SportsCenter's Top 10, in which you actually had to have a cable subscription back then. The only way to see game highlights or even watch the game was either you had to watch the game on time, watch the highlights at a certain time, or even tape the live game on a VHS. And I guess the last other option is to ask a friend or a buddy at work, did you actually see the game so you could get information? If you did none of those three, then you pretty much missed out. Jimmy possibly played in an era where it was the greatest group of wide receivers ever to play the game. In the 90s, Michael Irvin, Jerry Rice, Chris Carter ran the show. Granted, Jimmy came along in the late 90s, but again, his market didn't help him. When the 2000s came along, the spotlight was on Randy Moss, T.O., Chad Johnson, Marvin Harrison, etc. Jimmy's peers around the NFL at the time were Hall of Famers and Legends. And guess what? His personal best single season numbers are better than your favorite Hall of Fame wide receivers. I'm going to give you four wide receivers that played in Jimmy's era and we're going to compare personal best when it comes to catches and personal best when it comes to most yards in a season with all four of these wide receivers and compare them to Jimmy's. So the most balls that Jimmy Smith ever caught in a season was 116 receptions. Terrell's best season was 100 receptions. Randy Moss's best season was 111. Chad Johnson's best season was 97. And Michael Irvin's best season when it came to catching the ball was 111. Now when it comes to receiving yards in one season, the most Jimmy ever had was 1,636. T.O. had 1,400. Randy best season was a little bit under Jimmy's by four yards. Chad's best season was 1,400 and Michael Irvin's best season was 1,603. Now all of these guys are Hall of Famers with the exception of one, but if you look at the numbers, Jimmy's personal best when it came to catches and receiving yards is better than four all-time great receivers that played in the same era. So with that being said, here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. How come this man does not get Hall of Fame consideration? He has the longevity, he has the consistency, he has the numbers, he was top tier, one of the best receivers of his day. What else do you need to prove that this man is not a Hall of Fame pass catcher? I mean, for crying out loud, the Jaguars have only had 3,000 yard receivers since this man's departure after the 05 season. That just goes to show you that they may never have a receiver like Jimmy Smith ever again. After Smith retired from the game having played 12 seasons in the NFL, he was less occupied, which led him to drug dependency. For the first time in his adult life, he was in and out of jail for possession. This will be a pattern for him for years. In 2012, he caught a six-year bid for his repeated violations. The very next year, he went on house arrest. And in 2014, he was released from house arrest. While he was in-house, he got sober. In 2016, he joined the Pride of the Jaguars. 
to this day, he remains sober after seven years. He has a very low profile, but still follows the Jaguars news to this day. The Jaguars do not have any players in the Hall of Fame yet. If any former Jaguar deserves going first, Jimmy Smith should get that honor. As I was ending this video, I found Jimmy Smith's 1992 Cowboys card online. Out of all the great Cowboys players that have ever played in that franchise's history, this is probably the best player that never really played for him. Imagine if he could have contributed in any way to the triplets in the early 90s, but then again, that's one of those what-if scenarios that will be forever thought about in NFL history.